Well, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Darrell Owens, Christ to Rock Community Church, Cooper City, Florida. Several years ago, the Lord gave me a message entitled, The Lord of the Lost. It's a message that was preparing our congregation for an annual event called Family Fun Night. Each year, for 20 years, the Lord has given this event to us to give away to the city. Thousands of people have come through and thousands of people have heard the gospel message and many return to the Lord and many for the first time receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Watch this message. The message is called the Lord of the Lost. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you that your word is strength. Lord, we thank you for, for the assignment you've given to your servant today. That assignment is to communicate as, as much as possible something that can never be communicated, to bring understanding to something that can never be understood, and that is your love for your church. Lord, today I pray for every heart here today. I am aware that some stayed for the second service, Lord, today because you're doing something in the heart of your church, that you're setting your people free today. Lord, I pray for freedom in the house of the Lord today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I'm blessed now your servant to speak only the things of God that will edify, build up the hearer, all for the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, and the church said, amen. Uh, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. As you go there, let me tell you the, how I got to this portion of scripture. Last four weeks, we've been talking about the Lord of the lost, and we examine in small detail about the Lord's love for the leper, the Lord's love for uh, uh, the lame, the Lord's love for the unloved, the Lord's love last week for the lonely. We ask God, we petition God to send the lonely, the lame, the lost to our campus. And I believe the Lord did that. We saw many people that come on our campus and people from all over came to our campus and they were, meant, they were blessed. Many came to the prayer tent. Many gave testimonies. They were surveyed. They were told about how this has impacted their lives. And we thank God for that. As I was beginning to close the chapter or of this part of the year in this particular uh, verse here or this thought of the Lord of the lost, I felt the Lord say, and I don't say that often, but I felt the Lord say that... Um, I'm not done because I, I, I want you to know that I'm not only the Lord of the lost, but I'm the Lord of the found. That's us. Okay. Oftentimes in our world, we spend so much time. I'm, I'm the middle child of a large family. And because I'm the middle child of a large family, it's the ones that are sick. It's the ones that are young. It's the ones that's out there that need help. that get most of the help and the attention of our parents, right? And oftentimes in the church, we're guilty of talking more about the lost and the sinner and God's love for the lost and the sinner. And that is absolutely true. But today I'd like to bring in context and uh, this simple thought. Not only does God love the sinner, God absolutely loves the saints. He loves the saints. It's you. He has his incredible love for you. And I want to show you in scripture in Luke chapter 13, of course, Luke is one of the synoptic gospels. We understand that definition to be same gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John sits alone by itself because John really deals with the deity of Christ. Unlike the other gospels, they talk about his genealogy. They talk about the birth of Christ. But in John, John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And this word became flesh and tabernacle dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten son, full of grace, full of truth. And so these gospels are different, but, John, but, but Luke in particular is different than the other synoptic gospels in that Luke speaks more often about Jesus's love for women. Luke has an empowerment gospel for women. You need to hear this. There are 42 passages in the, in the gospel of Luke that deal with women, and 23 of those are unique to his gospel alone. This particular story that we're going to see in Luke chapter 13, Luke only writes about this. Matthew and Mark do not write about it. Another significant part of scripture here is this is Jesus's last appearance in the synagogue. The last teaching, the last time Jesus is in a synagogue on this earth is found in Luke chapter 13. And his last teaching, his last appearance in the synagogue is quite controversial. 
And I believe it's him showing his love, not only for the lost, not only for the sinner, but for the ones that are found, the ones who are in him, the ones who are faithful to him. And so with that preamble, I'd like to read the narrative found in Luke chapter 13, verse number 10 and following. Hear the word of the Lord. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And he immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it. He says, now reason, think of it. For 18 years be loosed from this bound, this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all of his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced in all the glorious things that were done by him. And those who love God's word said, Amen. Now, this is, this is quite controversial, and you need to understand this. The last appearance in the synagogue, and Jesus is, is really turning things around. He's, he's sending a signal. He's sending a signal, and the signal was heard. Now, let me tell you some things that we don't know. What we don't know is how old this woman was. We do know that she suffered for 18 years. Now, it could be that she was actually 18 years old and was born in this condition. We don't know. We do know that she was in this condition, and we, we don't know if she tried to lift herself, but we do know that she could not raise herself. We don't know if she had succumbed to the reality of that's who she is. We don't know. We also don't know where she was spiritually. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that she didn't ask Jesus to do anything. Jesus saw her. He called her, and then he said something to her. And then watch this. He put not his hand, he put his hands on her, both of them. This is what we do know. There are three things we're going to see here. There's a relational promise, and I want you to hear it be good. This is the assignment today. If you are in Christ, there are promises that are, that are ours. And one of the tricks of the enemy is that we don't live in the reality of those promises. You could be baptized, a believer in Jesus Christ. You could be filled with the Holy Spirit and yet find yourself as this woman bowed down, not able to raise yourself up in a condition where you can be for eight weeks, eight months, 18 months, eight 18 years in a condition in the house of the Lord, loving Jesus, committed to Jesus, but yet bowed over and not live in the relational promises that have been given to us. We spent time in Ephesians, and in Ephesians, we understood that we are receivers of the promises of Israel, okay? Now that you're in Christ, Gentile, you're no longer further away, but you've been brought near. And now you are heirs together, receivers of the promises of God's household. You're a part of God's household. And I want to encourage you today, first of all, there's relational promises. We're going to see that the religion has a problem. Religion has a problem. And we've got to be careful that we don't become religious as we follow the Lord. And then lastly, we're going to see our reward in perseverance. Okay, we've got 10 minutes to get this done, so hold on to your seats. All right. First of all, we see that there is a relational promise. Jesus references this woman. He calls her a daughter of Abraham. And by calling her a daughter of Abraham, he's talking about the covenant that God made with Abraham years ago. He told Abraham out of his country. Now Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. And now this whole genealogy, these people begin to form, all formed under the banner of the one true living God, set aside for God's purposes. We know that when these people went into a place called Egypt, following after Joseph, who was a son of Jacob, 
that they were in a situation where they needed to be delivered. Now, follow me on this. I want you to see how intimate God is with his people. This is what I want to get across to you. That if you're a part of Jesus, if you're part of the body of Christ, if you're part of God, he takes what you're going through personally. Okay? Hear this. It's not for the sinner, it's for the saint. It's not for the one that's lost, it's for the one that's found. It's not for the one that's not committed, it's for the one who is committed. And because we are committed, you need to know that what you're going through, God takes it personally. How do I know this? In Exodus, the first time we see the appearance of God in a form, God appears to Moses as a burning bush. Now, the, the difference in this bush was it was green and it was on fire and it wasn't being consumed. Uh, theologians would say, and I agree with this thought, that God presented himself in a state of something that was alive on fire and not being consumed. So think about just the torment of that, completely alive, and completely alive and yet completely on fire, and yet not being burned up, but being revived in the fire, but yet you're in the fire. See, he identified with the hurt of the people. They were in, they were in exile. They were in Egypt. They were under oppression. They were being uh, uh, treated as slaves. They were going through hardship and hard times. And when God presented himself to Moses, he said this to Moses. He said, Moses, Moses, he called Moses. He says, now the ground you're on is holy ground. And he says in chapter three of, of Exodus, I have heard the cry of my people. I have seen their oppression. And watch this. And I have come down to deliver my people. I want you to hear this believer. I want you to hear this child of God, that what you're going through, God sees what you're going through. He hears the oppression. He, when something happens to you, when something is done to you, I wish I had time to really go to it in Psalms 27. He, he sees that. He sees the opposition. He sees the, the tough times of your life. Why? Because he takes your suffering personally. Yes. I'll say it again. In Acts chapter 9, when Jesus confronts Saul, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting those people called the church? Is that what he said? No. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting who, church? Me. Wait a minute. Saul was persecuting people who were under the banner of Jesus. No, Jesus says, if you persecute the church, my people, you are persecuting me. You need to hear this. Now that you're in Christ, you've been found by him. You are part of his body. You're connected eternally to him. Now what you're going through, he's going through. Okay, you're never alone in, in, in Hebrews chapter 13. It says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I understand in this world dynamic that we're in, we feel sometimes that we're all alone, that we're on an island and only God cares for the sinner. He cares for the bad people. But I want you to know something. God loves his church. That's you. That's me. He has an incredible love for you. Jesus sees this woman and he calls her out. Now he calls it out. He spoke to her. Now watch this. She was bowed over. She didn't see Jesus. She heard his voice. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. See, it's sometimes we're so busy looking that we can't hear. Yeah. We can't hear what the Lord is saying. We're so busy looking around till we don't hear what the spirit is saying to us. He spoke to her. He called her to himself. There are people here today, um, you need to know, last night, the Lord moved in services. Earlier today, he moved in service, and there are people who stayed from last service to this service because of what God is doing. And there is a breakthrough that's happening in the church today. I'm just letting you know. I'm letting you know that he has come to break through because you can carry a Bible. You can read the Bible, and yet you can be bound by the influences of the enemy in your life. Did you know that? He called her. I want to show you this in Psalms 103. Watch this. The Bible says this. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is to the believer. He's compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. He will not consistently accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. Let me pause right there. Hold it. He does not punish us for all our sins. Me, pastor, sin? Yes, you. Why, well, I don't sin. You just did. Yeah. The psalmist says he doesn't punish us for all of our sin. 
But brothers and sisters, this is absolutely mercy. Listen to what he's, he's doing. What, what are you saying, preacher? You know, there's not immediate judgment. Why? And I'll show you. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is great, as high as the height of the heavens above the earth. Those who fear him, who respect him, who have an understanding of who he is. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, understand him, respect him, know him. For he knows how weak we are. <laughs> He's talking about the believer. He's not talking about the sinner. He's talking about those in him. He knows how weak you are. Yes, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Yes, in your spirit man, you're strong, but also in your flesh, you're very weak. And everybody said amen on that. And that's in Christ. In Christ, you have that. In Christ, Paul would say, I want to do good things, but I find myself doing bad things. Who's going to help me? I thank God I have victory through Jesus Christ. He knows how weak we are. Watch, watch this, verse 14. He remembers we are only dust. <laughs> I know you're dressed up. I know you look fine. But underneath all of those layers is just a big old bag of dust. Amen, church. Yes. But watch this. This dust will fade away, but your soul will live forever. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those are for the believers. He's compassionate to us. Look how he wraps up our lives. Our days are like on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom, then we die. The wind blows and we're gone as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord for you remains forever. On those who fear him, have an understanding of him, respect him, follow him, seek him. His salvation extends to children's children, to those who are faithful to his covenant, to those who obey his commandments, those who are in relationship with him. That's you. That's me. He says, listen, his love is unfailing. His compassion goes for not only your children, but your children's children. This is the love of God that's for us today. And this is the love that was extended to this woman. She came to church in her bowed over state, unaware that on that day, deliverance was coming to her. her. Listen, the Lord cares for you. I, I want that to sink in your heart today. Yeah, he loves the sinner. He died for the sinner. But he lives for the saved. You know, need to know that. <laughs> he loves you. He cares for you. What you're going through, he has you on his mind. He's thinking about you when you're not thinking of him. <laughs> He's watching over you when you're not even seeking him. He's full of compassion, brothers and sisters. And he demonstrates this. When Jesus was here, he tried to communicate the love of God. And he would go out of his way. In Matthew chapter 10, there's one occasion where Jesus told them, listen, the sparrows, when they fall to the earth, the Lord knows when even a small sparrow falls to the earth. And he asked the question, aren't you more valuable than a sparrow? But oftentimes, because of the weight of this world and the issues of life, we're so bowed over, we can't see how he's taking care of the wildlife around us. We can't see how the sparrow is never in line trying to get some help to get some food. No, the Lord supplies their needs. And every time, every time you go through issues, if you would just take a moment and just sit around and see nature, nature will tell you, God will take care of you. He'll take care of you. <laughs> and look what he says. He's so intimate into you. Verse number 30 of Matthew chapter 10. He says, even the hair on your head has been numbered. That's not metaphor. That's literal. Even the hair you lost. Hallelujah. <laughs> God's aware of it. Okay. Listen, he's aware of it. That's how much God is into you. He doesn't say of the neighbor. He says of you, and you got to get that concept. And I know we live in a world, and I'm going to get there in just a minute. We live in a world where we feel that we're out here all alone, and we're so fearful. Nobody cares. Nobody knows. Nobody loves. But I want you to know something. Because you are in Christ, he's intimately involved in your life. He knows what you're going through. Cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. 
He understands when you're in trouble, when you're sick. He understands the difficulties in your life. He knows what's going on. Let's get very quickly to religion's problem. Religion's problem is found in verse number 14. The synagogue ruler said, hey, there are other days to be healed on and not on the Sabbath day. See, religion has a problem because religion tries to order God's way. Religion tries to anticipate God's move. Religion tries to say, God, you did it this way, and you can only do it this way. And, and you only move this way. You only perform this way. God, you have to clear it with me before you do something different. That's what religion says. Religion says this to someone who has been delivered, someone who comes to the Lord, and they begin to express a love for Jesus. They tell the person, it don't take all of that, but the person should tell them, if you know what he's brought me out of, you'd understand why I give him glory. <laughs> but religion sits back and says this, it don't take all of that. Oh my Lord. Religion says, hey, you got to clear it by me. If it makes me uncomfortable, it may not be God's way. No, it might be God's way because it's making you uncomfortable. See, that's what religion says. See, religion, and, and, and you need to understand, not only was this woman bound, but the ruler of the Pharisees, he was bound too. He was bound by religion. He couldn't see God moving. He couldn't see the works of Christ. He couldn't glorify God in the moment of her deliverance. He, he couldn't rejoice with her what the Lord was doing in her life. Everyone else is rejoicing except this religious ruler and the others with him because they were bound to their ideas of God. They were bound to how things used to be and how God used to move when, in fact, Jesus came and he was moving by the Spirit of God. They missed God. And oftentimes when we become very religious we begin to exact, we begin to put our religious activity on other people. See, if you don't read your Bible, if you don't do the things I'm doing, then God can't be with you. Oh, no, 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 no. See, the religious person would have told Jesus on the thief at the cross while Jesus was hanging on the cross, now that you believe in Jesus, come down. We need to take you through new members class. We need to get you baptized. We need to take you through all of these rituals, all these things that you have to do to be accepted by him. But here's the truth. Whosoever believeth in him has been saved. Amen, church. Just that simple. Just that simple. Yes, they're going to walk this life out. They're going to become more like Jesus the longer they follow him and submit to the Spirit. God is working on them. Don't let religious people get in the way of your breakthrough today. There's some people here today, and we're going to open the altar in just a minute. And because you have a relationship with other people around you, and they see you at a certain status, and you are struggling with something. You're bowed over. You're this person. You come to church every week. You might be leading the class. You might be teaching. You might be involved in all kinds of things. But you know you come every week and you're bowed over. You are gripped. And because of the religious people around you, you don't want to appear as if you need God. But I want you to know something. Jesus sees you. <laughs> He's calling you today. He's calling you for your breakthrough this woman, there's a reward in perseverance. Again, I say, I don't know if this woman was 18 years old. I don't know if she was 80. All I do know is for 18 years, she was in this state. For 18 years, Jesus knew intimately that she was in this state. No indication that her problem was connected to sin because we saw earlier when the, the person was laid down before Jesus, the first thing he says, your sins have been forgiven. So this has nothing to do with sin. Obviously, it would have been in the scripture. This all had to do with demonic presence in her life that had taken her, to the, taken her to the point that she was infirm. And what that word means is a disabling spirit, disabled to enjoy, disabled to live, disabled to be what God has called them to be. There are people here today, and there's a disabling spirit in you. And let me say it this way. I got to hurry up because we're, we're out of time here. In, in John chapter 9, there was a boy that was born blind. And, and the religious people came to Jesus and said, the disciples, hey, Jesus, why is this boy in this situation? Did he sin? Maybe his parents sinned. And Jesus says, no, no, no. He's in this, in this situation so that the glory of God can be revealed. See, there are people that God brings in our midst because he wants to demonstrate his power. Perhaps this woman was 18 years in this condition so that the power of Jesus could be realized in their midst. 
so that, so that the hope of Christ could be theirs. So that at, at the last synagogue, at the last service of Jesus, that the church would be set on fire of the power of Jesus Christ. But no, there were people there. And, and they were bound as this woman was. They were bound in their religious activity. There's some people here today, you've got to persevere. You've got to push on through. And today you've been pushing on through. You've come to church week after week. And today deliverance has come to you. Maybe you're here today and you're bowed over. You are so gripped with fear. You're afraid. You're afraid to go to Walmart. You're afraid to get on your bike and go down a bike trail. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're afraid to go to the ATM. You're afraid to go to the mall. You wonder what's going to happen to you. What's going to happen? My life could be ended. But here's the glorious truth of a believer. If something happens to you, don't worry. If you die in Jesus, you're going to be resurrected with Jesus. Amen, church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't you let fear take you from living your life. Don't let fear stop you from enjoying your family. Don't let fear grip you and you're so afraid and you wonder who's in control. God is in control. Who's in control? Yes, he is. You're so gripped with fear. Maybe you're here today and you grip with rejection. Yes, you love the Lord. You're here every week. You, you come. You're, you're in the Bible study. Yeah, you're a young person. You've been rejected so much until now you said, I'm not going to date anybody else. You're 30 years old. You need to get over that. <laughs> you're so fearful. I'm going to be rejected. What happens? And what the spirit of rejection has gripped you to the point that you bowed over. And you are, you are, just, you are caught in that cycle. And you will not even, even think of love anymore. Think of trying anymore. Maybe you're in a relationship today. Maybe your marriage is on the six-month trajectory. Every six months, every 16 months, you, go in this, you come in this cycle over and over again. And you see a cycle. You know that, man, it seems like every, we're good, and then all of a sudden, here we go, 16 months or 16 days, 16 weeks, here we are. It's called a cycle. It's called being bound. Yes, you love the Lord. Yes, he loves you. Yes, you're a follower of Christ, but you've been bound by an infirmity. You've been disabled. Your breakthrough has come today. Maybe you're here because of guilt, and guilt has gripped you to the point that you bowed over. Yes, what you did was wrong. Yes, it was not God's will. It was sin, but that was years ago, and God has come to set you free from the guilt and the shame of your sin. Amen, church. And you're not living this life in Jesus. And you're not living it. Why? Because you won't even tell your testimony because you're ashamed of the power of God to break it in your life. When in fact, part of being uh, telling your story is the power of God to release you. And because you won't share your story, a breakthrough, you're not giving someone else the opportunity to believe that God can. And you're ashamed. And you're bowed over. You're here every week. Maybe you're here today and you are filled with hate. You hate. And you come to the house of the Lord and you're so hateful. And there's so many things out there that's driving hate. Amen, church. And you're caught up in this stuff and you get so fearful, so upset. And then we come to this place where all these ethnicities and all these different people, and you don't know how to act. You're so suspect. But you need to know you're in the house of the Lord. And in the house of the Lord, there's red, black, yellow, purple. All of us are welcome in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We all blood bought all of us in the same family, amen, church. Yes. And you bowed over. And maybe you're here, and I'm almost done. Maybe you're here, and you're gripped by negativity. You find a cloud on every sunny day. <laughs> See, way back over there, look, oh, if you squint real good, <laughs> it just can't be a joy. Because <laughs> you're afraid because you've been so disappointed. You're waiting for the other shoe drop all the time. You're waiting for the booger bear to come out the back. <laughs> you just can't be joyful. Why, but why? Because I just can't be joyful. I don't want to be flighty. I, 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 want to be, I want to be right. I want to be reasonable. I want to keep my mind together. No, 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 no. What you realize is you've been bowed over and you don't have strength for the day because the joy of the Lord, you're missing the joy. Why? The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's your strength. And when that text was given to the people in, in the book of Nehemiah, they were building something. And they were almost, almost finished. But Nehemiah told them, you're going to finish when you tap into the joy of the Lord. And you're building a life together. And you seem that you keep looking that you have more ahead of you. But you've got some behind you. God has been working in your life. 
The joy of what the Lord has already done is your strength to finish what the Lord wants to do in your life. The joy. Maybe you're here and, and every time you walk by a mirror, you see that. What? You know what that is. And you, you look at your body and you're, your body image bothers you. You're just so, you're so you're, every time you look in the mirror, you can't walk by a mirror without seeing that. And the enemy has convinced you that everybody sees that when most people don't care about that. But you're so bowed over. You're so bound by the Holy Spirit, by, not by the Spirit, but the, by the evil spirit that you can't realize that your body was beautifully and wonderfully made. Yeah. God crafted you. There's not a part of your body that's a mistake. But because of your body image, maybe you hear your self-image. And I'm last, this is it. Maybe you're here today, you compare yourself. You're so busy comparing yourself that you can't love yourself. That's the story, and I'm done. In Luke chapter 15, I'm done, or we're going to have 12 o'clock service. It's going to be bad in here. <laughs> uh, I'm done this. There's a story. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus gave this parable, which means it really didn't happen, but he's trying to communicate a message to you. The Bible says there was a boy, and he came home, and they threw a party for the boy. This man had two sons, and the ones that was there in the house that was with the father, when he was in the field, he heard a noise. He asked one of the servants, what's going on? He said, hey, it's your brother. Your brother's back, and your father has thrown a big party. And the brother was angry, and he refused to go in the house. But the father, watch this, the father who represents God the Father, the father went to the boy. Look what the boy says. I've been faithful to you. I didn't go out there and waste my life. I've been, fa I've been serving you. This son of yours goes out and wastes his life. He wastes your money. And you have the nerve to rejoice. You have the nerve to throw a party. I've been faithful to you. You have not given me one party because of my faithfulness. And maybe you're here today, you've been faithful to God. And it seems God is loving the sinner, but God does not see your faithfulness. But I want you to hear this very clearly, and this is going to mature some of you. You're supposed to be faithful to God because God is faithful to you. You're supposed to serve him. You have a reward in heaven. And the reward on earth is salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen, church. But watch what the Father says to him. The Father didn't say, oh, you're so disrespectful. But look what the Father says. The Father says, son, don't you know, everything I have is yours. Pause. That's what the Father says to you. Why are you comparing? Why are you saying, God, you're doing that for this person? You're doing that for this person? This is what God says to you, the believer, the one in the house, the one who's serving him, the one who's working for him, the one who's weakly faithful, 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 faithful to him. He says, listen to you. Listen, everything I have is yours. Everything. An enemy robs us of the realization of, of the joy of being in the household of God. That in the household of God, everything you need is there. Father, today, we pray for breakthrough. Lord, there are people here today bowed over. The weight of the enemy is so strong. Yeah, we're born again. We're faithful. We believe in Jesus. But the issue is so strong till it has us bowed over to the point we can't see. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would hear your voice. Just as you did this woman on your last church service, if I could say it that way, you saw her. You stopped service. You called her. You said to her, woman, you're loose from your disability. And then you put your hands on her. Lord, today I pray that you would put your hands on us today. As I did in the previous services, I know I'm on assignment this week.
He wants to set you free, my brother. Don't let, don't let the religious people around you stop you from your breakthrough today. In the house of the Lord, deliverance is in the house of the Lord. In just a minute, I'm going to stand. I'm going to ask you to stand. And when I ask you to stand, I want you to make your way to the altar. Preacher, why do I come to the altar? It's an act of faith. You, you, you're putting your body in motion to what your mind has already told you. You're acting, believing. That's it. Maybe you're here today and you're caught in a cycle. And brother, maybe a little porn has got you so bound. Maybe every now and then, it may not be weekly, it may not be monthly, but every now and then you just need to see something and you don't understand that the spirit of the enemy has you bound the Lord wants to set you free today. That little bit of porn is destroying your life. Nobody would drink just a little arsenic every now and then. It's destroying your life. It has you bowed over. You can't live in the freedom of Jesus. And today he calls you. He sees you. He calls you to him. Sister, maybe you're here. You're so busy comparing yourself. You haven't thanked God for the body that he's given you. You think that those pictures on TV, those pictures on those magazines are what you should be. No, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. There's not a flaw on your body. Not one. And today you want to be set free of that. I don't compare myself anymore. And many other reasons. Maybe you're fearful here today. You're afraid. He wants to break that today. God did not give us a spirit of fear. Would you stand with me? Would you come meet me at this altar today? Would you come believing? Lord, I don't want to be bowed over anymore. I want to be set free. I want to walk in the freedom that's mine in Jesus. Lord, I want to walk out straight. I want to walk out believing. I want to walk out. I want to leave it here. I don't want to take it out with me. Prayer counselors up here too. If some of you want specific prayer, you want someone to touch and agree with you, they're here. But I want you to come close. I want you to come close. Come, 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 come. I want to be set free today, Lord. It's a season of your breakthrough today. Who wants to break through today? Father, today, we want breakthrough in the house of the Lord today. Lord, we desire it. Lord, we know that this message is just for us. You're talking to us. Father, some of us are here because of fear. Some of us are here, Lord, because of rejection. But all of us are in need of your touch. Lord, today we believe, we know we believe, we know we have security in our salvation in Jesus Christ. We have faith. But Lord, today we want to be set free from the bondage of the enemy in our lives. Lord, you know. Father, today we pray that we would be delivered that you would heal us, Lord Jesus, of the guilt and the shame of our past. So much so until, Lord, we will broadcast what you've done in our lives of the power of Jesus. Lord, set us free from the opinions of other people. Father, that we might run this race with patience, looking to Jesus. Father, today I pray for the house of the Lord that we would not be fearful. Yes, there are troubles. Yes, there are issues. Yes, there's always a threat. But we believe, Lord Jesus, 
that Jesus is our Lord and Jesus is our Savior and Jesus is coming again. And when Jesus comes again, the dead in Christ will be raised. We believe. And Father, we know that the enemy is going to try his best to take away what you planted in our hearts. And Lord, we pray by the power of Jesus Christ that we would realize that the Spirit of the Lord is in us. And that the seed of your word would bear fruit in our lives today, tomorrow. We make a change today, Lord. We choose to stand up in Jesus. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for the body of Christ that while we run this race, that we would realize that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Restore the joy. Restore the joy of our salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for breakthrough. May we mark a place in our calendar that this day that was breakthrough. This day we saw Jesus in another kind of way. This day the chains and the bonds of sin was broken from us today. This day the enemy had to say no. And we said yes to Jesus. Yes. Yes to deliverance today. And I pray that out of his glorious riches he will strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner beings so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. I pray we've been rooted, grounded in his love, may have power together with all God's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep the love of Christ is for us. And to know this love that surpasses the ability to know that we might be filled to the fullness of the measure of God in our lives. And now to this great God who's able, able, able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to his power he's working in your life right now to him be the glory the majesty the dominion and power forever and ever and ever we pray and those who love jesus said amen 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 god bless you god bless you go in peace with us i'm so glad that jesus is the lord of the lost aren't you i pray that the word of the lord will go deep into your heart and encourage your walk with him Connect with us at crcconline.org. And until we see each other next time, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I encourage you, rejoice.